Seoul. 1988, Ben Johnson exploded across the 100 meter finish line, shattering records with a blistering 9.79 seconds. Gold, glory. Three days later, disgrace. He was stripped of his medal. Why? A single urine sample revealed this. And this is the telltale signature of this synthetic anabolic steroid. How did they know? The answer lies in a process called mass spectrometry. It's used not only to reveal cheats, but also is used in chemistry, forensics, and even archeology. span So what is mass spectrometry? And how does it work using the fundamental principles of physics and chemistry? Now, before we start, please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and support my work by buying me a coffee. Let's start. Here I have a schematic of the five main components of a mass spectrometer, and I'm going to go and unpack each of those components. But first, let's have an overview. We have a chamber, two processes occur here. The first is vaporization. The second process is ionization. Now into the section where acceleration takes place. Those particles continue on, and now what we have is a selection process where we are selecting a very specific velocity. In this fourth section, we have our deviation. Charged particles turn in a circular path where eventually they will be detected at the detector, so we have detection. Now you can remember those words by using the letters of V-I-A-S-D-D, -D, and what I've brought up with is we got very interested aliens suddenly demand donuts. So now let's look at each of these components and look at the scientific reasoning behind them. So let's start first with the chamber where we have vaporization and ionization. So we inject our sample into this chamber. Now this sample can be in the form of elements, but it could also be in the form of some form of molecules. So for example, I might insert chlorine gas, or I might do larger molecules such as organic molecules of some sort. We now have a heating coil, which if the sample isn't in a gaseous state, will certainly allow it to now be in a gaseous form. But importantly, down the bottom, I have an injection of electrons. Now what these electrons do, as they interact with the atoms or molecules, they'll knock off an electron. And what that means is, is now my molecules or atoms are now positively charged with a plus one. These particles are now moving, being charged through this chamber out the other side. What happens as they leave this chamber? Next is acceleration. Our particles are now entering here. And what I have are two plates that have a potential difference spread across them. This side will be positively charged and this side will be negatively charged. Now, I have an alternating voltage supplied here because generally speaking, it's usually not just one set of plates, it may actually be multiple sets of plates so that we can increase the velocities incrementally. I have now an electric field. Now that electric field is equal to simply the voltage that is applied across these two plates divided by the distance between these two plates. Voltage is defined as the work per unit charge. What we can now say is therefore, these charges will experience force over a certain displacement, and as a result, they will have work done on them. And so that work ends up being the charge that is on them. They all have the same charge multiplied by the voltage. Now that results in an increase in kinetic energy, and therefore that increase in kinetic energy is a half mv squared. What happens now is that all my charged particles will have the same gain in kinetic energy, but because they have different masses, they actually end up leaving with different velocities. Our particles will speed up and travel all the way through out here, but we'll have different velocities coming out of the acceleration portion. How do they then select the velocity that we require? So we have our charges entering, and now what you see are two plates and a magnetic field. The charges, as they enter the field, experience a force in the upward direction. And so these charges will therefore get a force due to the magnetic field 
in that direction. But these plates are also charged. And what that means is it's now experiencing a force in the downward direction due to the electric field. We have two forces. And if I allow these charges to move straight through the field, that means that these two forces are equal. And so what we end up getting is that the force due to the magnetic field is equal to the force of the electric field. QVB is equal to EQ. Rearranging that, I get V is equal to E over B. The electric field can be set and the magnetic field can be set so that my charges pass through undeflected. But as a result, you know the velocity that goes through. Therefore, you'll have your particles passing straight through undeflected and of course out the other end, which is what we want. What if my particle has a larger velocity than the one that we've just determined? Well, that means this particular force due to the magnetic field is actually greater because the force of the electric field is not dependent on the velocity. And so what we end up having is our charges will now start to deflect upwards and of course will not escape. Similarly speaking, if the velocity is too low, we start getting our charges now bending down, and again, it does not pass through. So as a result, we now have only molecules or atoms going through with our known charge and now also a known velocity. Let's now move on to the next stage, deviation. So now what we end up having is a whole array of different particles entering our field but they all end up having the same velocity. What differs, however, is that they will have different masses. So we might have M1, M2, and M3. Now I'm going to make that M1 is greater than M2 and is greater than M3. Now as they enter that field, they will experience a force that is perpendicular to their velocity. And that means we have centripetal motion. That means the force due to the magnetic field, F of B is equal to the centripetal force that's being applied. Now that one means we have QVB is equal to MV squared over R. So if I rearrange this, what I get is that R is equal to MV squared over QVB, and that means MV over QB. The thing is, we know the velocity and we know the magnetic field strength. And so what we end up getting is we get some sort of constant K multiplied by M over, now it is Q, and so because we're dealing here with the charge, because of the charge being plus one, we end up writing the Z value. What we really have here is what is called the mass to charge ratio. So this straight away tells us that the radius that occurs is proportional, because K is constant, to the mass per charge ratio. That means if I have a mass that is larger, it tells me that the radius will be larger. So that means that my particle with the greatest mass will have the greatest radius. Now that means our particle that is lighter will also curve, but as a result will have a shorter radius and therefore strike the plate here. And finally, the third particle will have a shorter radius again and will strike there. Now I have chosen the velocities such that all particles stay within this particular range. Now you can see why the selection of the velocity is important. If my velocity is too great for a set magnetic field in this section, then I'm, as a result, my velocity is gonna cause that particle to hit the edge of the tube here and will never reach the detector. Similarly speaking, if my velocity is too low, then as a result, my particle might actually hit the sides over here. That's why it's important to select the correct velocity in the velocity selector to match the magnetic field strength in the deviation section. Finally, let's have a look at the detector. Now, in essence, the detector is simply a plate that detects the arrival of charged particles. In essence, as the charged particle strikes the plate, that charged particle will rip off an electron from the plate, which as a result will cause a current to be produced. As a result, when it's attached to computers, it will measure the current for each type of particle that strikes the plate. 
And as a result, a graph is generated that gives us, therefore, how many particles struck the plate in a particular spot. And the further across the plate, the heavier those particles are. Let's have a look at an example. And here I have the example of a spectrum through a mass spectrometer of chlorine gas. Now, why do we have so many different peaks? Well, the first one is pretty obvious. You can say, well, if one is sitting clearly at 35, and that's the mass number for chlorine, and therefore that gives you your mass to charge ratio of 35, because of course, Z is equal to one. But we have other peaks. Well, the first thing to remember is that we have the isotope of chlorine to account for as well. So you'll find that we have also the isotope of chlorine 37. And therefore, it has the same charge, but it has two extra neutrons. And so therefore, you're going to get a slightly heavier chlorine atom striking the plate. And so as a result, you'll see some of those. Now you can see in our case, we have a lower abundance, relatively speaking, to the chlorine 35s. But then you might ask the question, what about the peaks at the other side? Well, remember, chlorine actually naturally occurs in terms of a diatomic molecule. And so what happens is as chlorine is entered into the chamber, what you might get is your chlorine diatomic molecule splitting up, resulting in our peaks for 35 and 37. But you will also have chlorine molecules that are also charged passing through. And so what you'll get is, for example, in the case of two chlorine atoms, both with the isotope number of 35, giving you a peak for 70. But then you also have a possibility that your diatomic molecule is a 37 and a 35 and a 37 and a 37 and therefore results in those peaks. Now here I have an example of the introduction of ethanol, which is in chemistry terms an alcohol. But why do we have a whole bunch of peaks? We obviously can work out what the final peak is because the final peak is simply the whole molecule that is charged, which is made up of two carbon atoms. And of course we have six hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And so you can work out what the total mass number is. But what about the other peaks? Well, what happens is that the ethanol can fragment into a number of pieces. It might fragment into CH3, which has a mass number of 15. It might fragment into a molecule C2H5, and that would be the peak of 29. Now, what about the larger peak? What you have is CH3O. And then lastly, the one just shy of our final peak is C2H5O. So that summarizes how our mass spectrometer works and how you can interpret the data. Mass spectrometry. With that understanding of electromagnetism and the unique signatures of molecules, it provides a precise fingerprint of chemicals. Think beyond the pink scandals such as Ben Johnson and Lance Armstrong. Chemists use it to precisely determine the ratio of various isotopes of the elements, like the chlorine example that we did earlier. Forensics. This technology tackles diverse crimes from identifying accelerants in arson to detecting subtle poisons, as seen in the current mushroom poisoning case where it pinpoints the specific toxins in tissues. Even archaeology leverages its precision for radiocarbon dating, revealing the age of ancient samples, like Utsi the Iceman discovered in Italy, placing his life around 3350 BCE. So from the fundamental building blocks of matter to solving modern crimes and unlocking the past, mass spectrometry reveals the intricate chemical story behind everything. I hope that has given you a deeper understanding of mass spectrometry. Please like, share and subscribe and please put a comment down below if this is useful. And please support my channel by buying me a coffee or even better, by supporting me via Patreon. My name is Paul from Physics High. Bye for now.